So what do you think? Should the landowner give the gardener one more year? Or should he just cut the tree down? How you answer that question will probably depend on how you read this parable. When I come to this parable at first, my instinct is to want to save the tree. I know that it takes four years for a fig tree to mature to the point of bearing fruit. And that means that this tree, being three years overdue, is about seven years old. Seven years is a lot of time and energy to invest in this tree to simply cut it down. But if I'm being honest, the real reason I want to save this tree is because I have the feeling that Jesus is telling this story about me, that I'm the fig tree. And I don't want to be cut down because, the, frankly, that sounds rather unpleasant. Anybody else read it that way? I see a lot of heads nodding, yeah. But here's something to think about. If I'm the tree and Jesus is the gardener, pleading with the landowner for clemency, does that make the landowner God? Is God ready to judge me for my sins? Does this story leave me feeling worried about God's judgment? Here's the thing. I don't really know why I read this parable that way. As far as I can remember, nobody ever told me that that's what this parable meant. In fact, Jesus doesn't even imply that, does he? A lot of times he'll begin a parable with, the kingdom of God is like, but he doesn't say that here, does he? So where does that idea come from? I have a hunch about that. And I think it might be, it might have to do with how we see God. There are a lot of images for God in scripture, but the one that we seem to latch onto the strongest is God as king, as master, as Lord. In fact, Lord is the name we use to address God most frequently after the word God, right? And it makes me wonder if we've been trained to see the universe as a pyramid with God at the top. And so because of that, in stories like this, we want to put God at the top in the position of the most power. In this case, that's the landowner. And I think that because we believe that, or maybe, maybe not because, but I think maybe the other thing that's going on here is I wonder if we, we read the parable like this because we believe somewhere that we deserve that judgment. Maybe not us, but somebody does, right? Somebody, right? Maybe I don't, but certainly there are people like Hitler or Stalin or Pol Pot that definitely deserve that judgment, right? And we need somebody at the top to dole out that judgment. But when you think that, then the question becomes, where do you draw that line? Reading the parable this way puts Jesus, the gardener, in the position of defending us, the tree, from God, the landowner. With a theology like that, it's no wonder people are leaving the church. We can't even seem to figure out who this God is that we worship. God is schizophrenic, defending us from God's own self. We can't seem to figure out whether God loves us or wants to kill us. So here's what I'm pondering this week. What if God is not the landowner? What if Jesus isn't the gardener? What if I'm not the fig tree? Let's go back to the story for a moment. Remember what I just said. It takes four years for a fig tree to mature. This landowner has waited three years beyond that. That's almost twice as long as he expected to wait. What if that tree were in your yard? What would you do? You planted this fig tree, expecting it to bear fruit, and there's nothing. Would you keep it? What if you're depending on that fig tree for food or for profit? Would you be as patient as this landowner waiting three years? Or would you have cut it down a year or two already ago? And what about this gardener? He's pleading, asking for more time 
to take what are really kind of drastic measures for this fig tree, aerating the roots and fertilizing with manure. Fig trees generally are pretty self-sufficient. And this one's not planted in a bad spot. It's in a vineyard for Pete's sake, right? There's fertile soil and plenty of water. It has everything it needs. And that suggests that what this gardener wants to do is over the top and may not do any good at all. But more to the point, where was this intervention three years ago? Hmm? This gardener's been watching this fig tree bear no fruit for three years, right? Why didn't he do this last year? Why didn't he do this the year before? If the landowner had been paying attention, hadn't been paying attention, would the gardener ever have done anything? Or would he have just sat there and let the tree go for God knows how many years, never bearing fruit, never being a proper fig tree? Jesus tells us this parable in response to a question from the crowd. Someone brings up these Galileans killed by Pilate, right? Now, the cultural assumption was that if something bad happened to a person, that was God's punishment for their sin. The implied question might be whether these Galileans had committed some sin to, to deserve this fate. But Jesus challenges that assumption. The guilt or innocence of these unfortunate Galileans is immaterial, he says. What about those 18 killed in the freak accident when the tower fell? Surely they didn't just happen to be the 18 worst people in Jerusalem, did they? They were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. But unless you repent, Jesus says, you will all perish just as they did. I read this, and I read Jesus telling us to wake up. While we're busy wondering about whether or not these Galileans may have done something wrong, Jesus is wondering why nobody is questioning that Pilate just killed a bunch of people in the middle of their worship. But even Pilate is just a symptom. Maybe our biggest problem isn't God's judgment. Maybe our biggest problem is us. Our patterns and structures of our daily lives that are slowly killing us. If, for example, our systems of power and governance produce leaders like Pilate, something must be really wrong with them. But what if that's the way we like it? I wonder, maybe we let Pilate get away with this because that's what we think God does, right? If we need a God to punish those people who do bad things, we need a pilot to punish those people who do bad things. Maybe we'll let Pilate get away with this because God is like that for us. Maybe we're worshiping a God who's like Pilate. But see, the problem in this parable isn't the landowner's greed or capriciousness. The problem is that this tree is not bearing fruit. That is literally what fig trees are created to do, right? to bear fruit and make more fig trees. This tree didn't decide not to bear fruit. Something's wrong with the tree. It's sick or it's unhealthy. Why didn't the gardener see this earlier? Why can't we see the sin that's slowly killing us? Why do we go about our daily lives behaving as if nothing is wrong? when there are things like climate change and war and systemic racism? Why can't we see that these things are killing us, that we are not bearing the fruit that we were created to bear? I wonder if Jesus is trying to point out the harm that we are already enduring by not paying attention. Maybe we are like the gardener more than the fig tree, the gardener who doesn't notice anything is wrong until the landowner shows up with an ax. As I listen to this gardener describe what he's going to do to this tree now that it has his attention, I hear Isaiah asking, 
Why do you spend your labor for that which does not satisfy? I wonder if maybe God is asking us why we're investing so much time and money and energy in things that give us nothing in return. Maybe God is in this story offering bounty and sustenance in the form of a new tree that will bear plentiful fruit, all at no cost to us. (laughs) So maybe God is the landowner after all. Incline your ear to me, God is saying. Come to me. Listen so that you may live. So here's what I wonder about this parable. If we're the gardener, what are those barren fig trees that we're trying to save? And are they worth saving? Where are we as people, as communities, as a nation, dumping time and energy and money and emotional investment into possessions or programs or things that cannot fill us up? but are only bleeding us dry. What patterns, what values, what beliefs, what beliefs about God are hurting us more than they're giving us life? If you're like me and you hear this parable and your first emotion is one of fear or distaste, you are not alone. It's hard to think about cutting down something as big and important as a fig tree. It's unpleasant to think about letting go of something that's integral to who we are. Something that has been so important to us. It's hard to think about moving to a retirement home, for example. It's hard to think about quitting a job that you've had for a long time. It's hard to think about dying. I read a book on pruning recently, and there's a term for what happens when you cut something down to the ground and let it grow back. It's called a radical renovation. (laughs) I don't know whether that sounds really appropriate or understated. A radical renovation. Lent is our call to radical renovation. Lent is the season when we say we renew ourselves in the gift of baptism. We pray that God will prepare us for the Paschal Feast. During Lent especially, we remember that when we are baptized, we are baptized into Christ's death so that we may share his new life with him. Rather than fearing death, rather than fearing radical renovation, baptism calls us to consider that sometimes God's uh, death can be God's gift to us, a way to escape what is slowly killing us in the hope of what could bring us life. I mentioned last week reading the story of Moses with our preschool kids and little lambs. And I'm remembering this week that when Moses was born, his mother did something insane. She threw her baby in the river, which incidentally is what Pharaoh was doing with all the baby boys, right? But his mother included a basket in the deal. Why would she do that? I asked the kids. She did it because she knew that if Moses stayed in her house, he would die. If she put him in the river, he might die. But he might not die. At least in the river, there was a chance, right? And he did survive. And he did grow up to do the thing that God had called him to do. And that thing itself was insane, right? He led God's people out of Egypt, away from the flesh pots and the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic that they savored so much into this wilderness where there was nothing but this manna to eat. And in spite of all of their grumbling and complaining and pleading to go back, He led them out because all that lay ahead for them in Egypt was slavery and death. Yeah, they might die in the wilderness, but they might not. They might, in that wilderness, find freedom and the way to a new home. And for 40 years, they traveled in that promise. And 
all along that way, they kept looking back to Egypt, right? They kept falling victim to those same old self-destructive desires. And a lot of them didn't make it to the promised land. But you know what? Some of them did. Why? Because God was there, leading them the whole way, drawing, dragging them forward with Moses. During our own 40 days of preparation, Jesus asks us to do something insane. To take a good, hard look at our lives, to examine our habits and our priorities, those structures and institutions to which we entrust our lives and our health and our safety, and to be ready to radically renovate those things if we need to. Because as hard as it might be to believe those might be the very things that are killing us. If we don't cut them down, we will surely perish. But if we do cut them down, we might not. Jesus asks us to, instead of turning away from death, to turn toward death, to turn toward baptism with the hope that in him we might find new life. But God's might is a lot stronger than our will. This is what God does. God brings life. That's fundamentally who God is. What we just forget sometimes is that life and death are always in balance. That they need one another. God is not the one sitting on some high throne doling out punishment for sins. That's what we want, right? That's the system that we desire. And that's the system that kills us. No, God is the one who is running towards us, holding nothing back, not even God's own flesh and blood, to save us from the ways that we are killing ourselves. To save us from those deadly patterns and systems and traditions to which we have willfully enslaved ourselves. And nowhere is that more evident than in Jesus giving his life, voluntarily bearing the weight of our so-called justice, to pull back the curtain and show us how often our religion, even, worships Pilate rather than God. So that's the question for us in this Lenten season. As we examine the vineyards of our lives, what trees are not bearing fruit? Where are we spending our time and our energy and our money on things that are not filling us up? Where do you hear God calling you, calling us to come to the waters, to cut down the barren trees and plant new ones to try something new and to find life more abundant than we ever could have imagined.